Director, the University of the West Indies Seismic Research Center, Dr. Irusala Joseph, geologist and current lead of the scientific team at the Belmont Observatory, Professor Richard Robertson, volcano seismologist at the UVSRC, based at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory, Mr. Roderick Stewart. Specially invited guests, colleagues at the UE, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for this virtual media conference, La Freya Science and Impact. I'm Stacey Edwards, Education and Outreach Manager at the UE Seismic Research Center, and I will be the moderator for today's event. La Freya Volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines has had at least six explosive eruptions in the historic period, the last of which was in 1979. In December 2020, a dome building or effusive eruption began at La Soufre Volcano and a rotation of scientific teams comprising of scientists and technicians from the UESRC and the Montserrat Volcano Observatory and Rio have been deployed on the island since December 2020, working in partnership with the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, to monitor activity. The eruption moved into an explosive phase on April 9, 2021. And to date, there have been at least 30 identifiable explosions since then, resulting in several volcanic hazards which have impacted St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as neighboring islands. Based on timely advice from the UESRC team to the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, residents in vulnerable areas were evacuated roughly 24 hours ahead of the first explosion. And to date, thankfully, there has been no loss of life. Today, we are joined by three members of the UESRC team, each of whom has played a fundamental role in managing and monitoring this eruption. Each of the panelists will deliver a brief presentation for two to three minutes, and this will be followed by a Q&A segment. We kindly request that all mics remain muted throughout today's session, unless you're asking a question. Our first presenter, Dr. Erosila Joseph, is a volcanologist and director of the UESRC. In addition to her duties as director, Dr. Joseph manages the geothermal monitoring program, which involves the collection and analysis of volcanic gases and geothermal waters in the islands of the Lesser Antilles, and its application to monitoring changes in volcanic activity. She has been associated with the UESRC for the past 17 years and has served as a director since 2019. Dr. Joseph will discuss the critical role of the UE in managing the ongoing eruption through the involvement of the Seismic Research Center. Dr. Joseph, I turn over to you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Edwards. So just to familiarize everyone listening in um, and looking on, the role of the SRC includes the, the monitoring and the of the earthquake and volcanic risk in the volcanic activity in the English-speaking Eastern Caribbean islands. We have the largest geophysical network of over 60 stations in the region, and we provide contributing territories with advice on geologic hazards. We also support the contributing, um, the disaster management agencies with public education efforts and conduct research in, into the um, geological processes that occur in our region. We also, um, in the last over 60 years of our uh, operations, there have been a number of volcano seismic crises and volcanic eruptions throughout the islands in which we monitor. And this includes um, islands from St. Kitts and Nevis all the way down to um, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, in addition to which, our response specifically for the eruption of La Soufri in in St. Vincent included, um, as Mrs. Edwards mentioned, deploying a team on island since December when the eruption began effusively. Uh, the, the main purpose at that time was to strengthen our monitoring network uh, on the island. We've also worked closely with the National Disaster Coordinator to coordinate monitoring efforts there, which included the additional field work, such as rock sampling, gas sampling, we provided regular advisories and briefings to a large body of stakeholder and decision makers. And we responded to media inquiries and developed and implemented a social media program to address um, and provide public awareness materials. We also participated in a number of public and virtual town hall meetings. 
So with respect to, um, to the ongoing eruption, um, this, this, the steps that we've taken has helped significantly in our ability to provide the warning that was necessary in order to assist the evacuation of people prior to the explosive activity on April 19th. So um, with that, I would like to now uh, hand over to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. Um, and just to, just to correct there, the explosive activity began, began sorry, on April 9th. Um, I know we're all managing quite a lot, so that was a bit of a, a tight loop slip there with uh, Dr. Joseph. So our next um, presenter will be Mr. Roderick Stewart. And as Dr. Joseph would have, would have mentioned, the eruption is really being managed by a multidisciplinary team. So Mr. Roderick Stewart is a volcano seismologist at the UESRC who is based at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory. The MVO is currently managed by the UESRC and six of our scientists are permanently based in, permanently based, sorry, in Montserrat. Mr. Stewart has over 30 years of experience in the field and he has worked on volcanoes in several countries, including Papua New Guinea and Japan. He served as director of the MVO from 2012 to 2019 and his experience as a volcano seismologist on active volcanoes has really been invaluable in the monitoring of the current activity at La Soufra in St. Vincent. Mr. Stewart has been working and living in the Eastern Caribbean for more than a decade and studies seismic or earthquake activity associated with volcanoes and how it relates to other data. So today he will be talking about the role of the seismic network, which is really the backbone of monitoring operations and keeping watch over La Soufra. And he will provide a summary of activity. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Stacey. Seismic monitoring is the, the monitoring of earthquakes associated with the volcano. And it's our mainstay because we have this data in real time. The seismic monitoring plus the visual monitoring are usually what drive real time decisions about what's going on. So we have a total of eight seismic stations in St. Vincent picking up signals from the volcano. And my job is to interpret these signals and try and work out what's going on. So I've tried to summarize this in this plot that will appear on the screen. The plot's very complicated, but I will try and explain. It basically shows data for the time period from the 8th of April until this morning. The top panel shows a thing that we call RSAM. It's basically a measure of the energy being radiated by the volcano. In the bottom of this top panel, there's a number of red triangles. Each of these represents an explosion at the volcano. There's been a total of 31 explosions so far. So with the, the, the RSAM, the energy, we have data here from two stations. The blue station at the left-hand side of the plot is close to the summits and picks up small activity. And you can see a, a number of spikes that are actually appearing in the day, day and a half before the first explosion. And this is what we call banded tremor. We were seeing episodes of continuous seismic signal that were coming and going fairly regularly. And this is something that is very common in the run-up to an arch. The middle panel shows the count of a particular type of earthquake. These are called volcano tectonic earthquakes. These basically represent when the rock is being cracked by something trying to push through it. And you can see very clearly there was a swarm of these BT earthquakes when the banded tremor started. We then went into what's called continuous tremor. So we have continuous shaking, but not banded. And then we had this first explosion. That was then followed by another swarm of BT earthquakes. Uh, by this stage, the, the blue station had expired. It was destroyed in the eruption. And we're showing data from the, the black station, which is a bit further away. And this shows that for the, the, the subsequent days, we basically had continuous tremor with a number of peaks in it. And each of these peaks and tremor represents an explosion, which are the red triangles. And you can see fairly clearly that the the explosions are getting larger time between them as time goes by. 
and getting longer time between each of the explosions. The bottom panel shows a particular type of earthquake that we call LP, or long period. And these are usually recorded when magma is moving. And we can see fairly clearly that you know, these have occurred only after maybe 20 explosions. We then start getting LP earthquakes. And that's probably because in the early part of the eruption, there was no pressure to stop the magma. It's only when the magma was trying to force its way through something that we see the LPs. But we see a very clear pattern of them building up before an explosion, then going away, building up again. And this is basically carried on throughout the explosions. The LPs have not gone away, which means there's still magma trying to get up there. And if you look at the very right-hand side of the bottom panel, you can see that the LPs are slowly growing in numbers again. That was the situation this morning. They, they have actually died down a little bit and are growing up again. But it shows that there's still magma trying to get out. And there's still clearly a pattern here that will lead to further explosions. So that's really it. That's a, a basic summary of the, the seismic activity and how it's basically um, recorded this eruption. Stacey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod, um, for taking the time to break down some of those technical terms because we do get quite a bit of questions on our social media platforms with people asking about what does a long period of quick mean, what is a banded tremor. So we're pleased that you were able to break that down a bit. Um, I'd like to introduce our final presenter for today before we move into the QA segment. Professor Richard Robertson is a geologist and volcanologist whose interest in volcanology was inspired by his personal experience during the 1979 eruption of the Soufre volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He joined his staff at the Seismic Research Center in 1993 and has served several tours of duty as chief scientist of the MBO and was its director from October 98 to March 99. He was appointed head of the Seismic Research Unit in July 2004 and director of the renamed Seismic Research Center in July 2008 to August 2011, and again in October 2012 to October 2019. He has a keen interest in the dissemination of scientific information to vulnerable island communities, and is an experienced field researcher as well as an academic. Professor Robertson is currently the scientific team lead at the Belmont Observatory in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Today, Professor Robertson will provide a summary of activity at La Soufre since the onset of the explosive phase on April 9th, and he will provide some insight into what we might be able to expect next. I'll hand it over to you, Professor Robertson. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, okay, so what's been happening so far? As, as um, Roderick, Rod indicated, uh, explosive activity started on the on the ninth, uh, and and fortunately there were a number of clear indicators that things were heading in a particular direction that allowed um, the team to provide guidance to the authorities here, so that they were able to move people prior to that. Um, maybe at some point we'll get back to that, but we leave that there for now. What has happened since is that we have moved from a period initially in the first two or three days, as you would have seen from the graph that that Rod showed of very intense um, um, venting, tremoring, and explosions at the volcano. In fact, in the first couple of days, we got 10 or 15 and upwards discrete explosions. And what that means is that magma, which was gas rich, had come from beneath the surface. And because of the conditions under which it had come, it had pressurized sufficiently and it had enough gas in it to explode or fragment itself upwards and create an eruption plume that went very high into the atmosphere. In the early parts of the eruption, these explosions were very intense and therefore there was a lot of ash that went into the atmosphere, went into the air. And, and essentially, because it went on for a few hours, a few days, more or less continuously, um, without really stopping fully in terms of the ash venting, there was a lot of ash dumped in St. Vincent and Grenadines and also in Barbados and as far, and, and in fact, in some cases in St. Pusha. Now, that period of intense um, activity became um, more discreet as the days went on, so that by, by say, 
uh, from Friday when we had the intense activity by Sunday and Monday, we began to see some gaps in terms of the space in between the explosions. So the explosions and eventing became less continuous and more discrete. Um, and as Rod indicated, as we continued, the gaps between the explosive eruptions um, were lengthened, and we began to see the evidence that uh, you had magma moving through the VTs and long period events. And, and now we enter a period where the gap between the explosions are up to a few days. Um, we, and, and, and during those few days, you have long period events, earthquakes that suggest that magma is still moving, and then at the culminate for less with an explosion. Um, the explosions have varied from at the beginning, they were more what we call plinian or, or subplinian, which is um, a, a kind of explosion which results in very high ash plumes and very fine, uh, very fi high eruption plumes and very fine ash, uh, coarse ash, mainly ash and less pyroclastic flows. To now what we have in is more volcanian explosion. And in volcanian explosions, the plumes may not get as high but they involve a lot more blocky material and there is a chance and there has been the generation of pyroclastic density currents. So these, these flows that, that happen when material moves down the mountainside instead of material going up in the air, it goes down the mountainside very quickly. Um, it's very destructive, it's very hot, it moves very fast. And you've had a lot of those happen, particularly in the southwestern part of the country, in the southwestern part of the island, of the volcano that is. So um, valleys from... Um, it just, just south of the volcano all the way to the northwest, you have had pyroclastic flows get into the coastline. Um, most of the volcano otherwise has been affected by ash and by other effects. So the north, north, northwest, eastern side have been mainly ash impacts. We would expect as we continue for this kind of activity to, to, to continue. That is that you, you may have discrete explosions from the volcano. Um, they may be of similar kind of order as we have had in the past, but they may be smaller. And then we might have discrete um, periods when it's quiet. Our interpretation of all of this is that it seems that it don't, the, the volcano is really trying to get rid of all the gas that, that came up in the pulse that started it all going. And as it gets rid of the gas, there's a possibility that it would then reform a dome. Um, and, and eventually the dome may actually help in, in, in stopping the, 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 the continued explosions that you have. So in fact, what we think we have in now is that it's trying to form a dome and then it's destroying the dome with the explosions. Um, and, and we'd expect that to continue for some time before the current, what can we call the current batch of magma that came up and started it going is, is has fully run its steam. It's possible that that might be the end of it. That is, that is the end of the eruption. The volcano goes back to sleep for the next um, N number of years. But it is also possible that another batch of, of gas which magma may come along and essentially start the process going again where we have a very intense period and then you have it going into sort of more discrete events and, and possibly formation of a dome. Uh, so that's what we, we, we think can happen. So we'd expect in the next few weeks, the next few months, that you could possibly have continued explosions, that you could possibly have the restart of the growth of a dome as well as you could possibly have waning of activity such that it, it goes back to sleep. Um, we, would, we have now a monitoring system in place that we think we can detect if there is a sort of a new invigoration of material and a new restart. We have a monitoring system in place that we detect even what, what to, and understand what's happening now. So we think that we are well-placed to continue to provide the service that we've been doing um, and, and ensure that people stay safely away from the volcano and protect life and, and, and ensure that this volcano can continue in its current evolution and do what it's doing without necessarily impacting too much on people on St. Vincent. That said, one final thing I'll make a note of is that obviously one of the major impacts of the volcano is on St. Vincent itself. The volcano has impacts wider field. And one of the most significant is certainly the dispersal of ash. The, the, the eruption plumes when they go up in the air, they generate a lot of ash. And the ash really goes anywhere the wind blows blows it to a large extent. And that's what has been happening. It has affected Barbados, it's affected St. Lucia. And it's possible that if you continue to have explosions, once the explosions are big enough, once the wind direction are in, uh, in the correct way, that surrounding territories can be affected. And, and so volcanic eruptions and volcanic hazards is something that even if you don't have a volcano in the region, you have to factor into your equation in terms of dealing with hazards. I think I'll leave it there. And, and if there are any further questions, I'll take them as we go along. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Robertson, for that um, summary.
And thank you to all of our presenters. We will now move into the Q&A segment. Um, members of the media joining via Zoom will have the opportunity to ask live questions. If you would like to ask a question, we ask to please use the raise hand feature, which may be found under the reactions button in the bottom menu near the bottom of the Zoom screen. Questions will be answered in the order in which they were received. When it is your turn, you'll be invited to submit a question and we ask that you unmute your mic, turn on your camera and state your name and organization. We're also asking if you can kindly limit questions to no more than two at a time so that the presenters may answer more effectively. For ease of reference, uh, kindly requesting that you include the name of your organization on the Zoom screen. If you could just rename that, please. And this may be done by clicking the blue icon on the top right-hand corner of your screen. Thank you very much to the media for complying. Uh, for those joining via UETV or SRC social media platforms, SRC colleagues will be responding to questions posed in the chat box. So we now invite questions from the media. All right, hi, um, Radio Montserrat, you can go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, this is Winston Afokebi from Studio Two here at Radio Montserrat, and I also have along with me James White Jr. He's our news director here at Radio Montserrat. My first question is to probably Richie or Rod. What is the difference in terms of the style and the intensity of this eruption when compared? to the eruption in 1979. Uh, so you want me to take that one or Rod? Um, you have to take that one, Right, so um, Kafu, the, the, the intensity of the start of this eruption, certainly the first couple of days was much greater than anything we saw in 79. The 79 um, plumes and the 79 explosions were more of the type that we had within the last latter part of, of the period. So within the last four or five days, not within the last two or three days. The, within the first two or three days, they were much more intense. They, they were much, the, the plumes much, much, went much higher. The, the, the size of the explosion was much more vigorous because it essentially fragmented the rock into fine, much small pieces such that you had so much ash being created while the latter ones, which were the volcanic explosions, are more similar to what you have had routinely um, in 79. So I'd say that um, it's, it has some elements that are similar to 79, but the elements are only within the last few days. And certainly, overall, um, if I was to measure, I would say that the intensity of this, this eruption overall has been a, um, a bit higher than a bit different. There's a lot more material produced. There's a lot bigger plumes, a lot more explosive events. The paraclastic flows have gone further into different valleys than 79. So it's quantifiably a bigger event than 79 in terms of, of, of possibly in the end, in terms of material and in terms of explosivity. Um, but there are elements of 79 that are similar. Thank you very much, Richie, for that. Um, one more question from Radio Monster. One, one just going two at a time more. for now. Yeah, just one more, question. then I'll Maybe hand over to sure. James White. I, or we here on Montserrat, we wanted to find out what was the run out of the pyroclastic flows and maybe even the power from the density currents. I think we used to call them uh, surges here on Montserrat. The reason for that is we know here in Montserrat, many of the flows reach the sea. St. Vincent is a lot bigger. So we were trying to get um, some indication as to the, whether in miles or kilometers, what was the run out like from those flows and the pyroclastic density currents from the eruptions. Um, I'll, I'll probably go with that one too. Um, Kafu, it's, it's the, the furthest I think one has gone is down the Wallabu. Um, river and reach the sea. It has, it has essentially reached the sea along the southwest, south southwestern side of the country, along all the river valleys there. And the river valleys, in terms of their distance from the summit, 
range from about um, two or three kilometers to up to five, five, five or six kilometers or so. So it varies that that kind of distance, probably two or three miles um, in in maximum extent. Probably probably three of yeah, probably three and a half miles in maximum extent in terms of where it's gone. Um, in terms of the, the yeah, so that's a, uh, it's, it's that kind of distance, yeah. All right, um, Mr. Ayas, you can go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about that. The SRS from the Express newspapers in Trinidad. Uh, Pastor Richardson, I know earlier this week you stated that the the ash would have been sent for some analysis in Trinidad. I don't know how far this has reached. Can you give us some updates, please? Thanks. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's for me. Or Pat could actually answer that one. Stacey, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. So to answer your question, we we there were some challenges getting the ash to Trinidad, as you know that the seaport is uh, de dedicated right now, or it was in terms of um concentrating on the relief efforts. So we were able to get it out, get the samples out of St. Vincent, now in Trinidad, and we're compiling a list of, um, there's been a list of people, a number of people, sorry, who've requested um, samples of the ash. So, so the ash is, wouldn't be analyzed in Trinidad. We have to send them out to colleagues in Jamaica and the UK for analysis. So I'm working on that currently with some other staff members at SRC, and the samples will be sent out this week. Thank you, Pat. Um, I know that James White from the DMC was actually just waiting with Kafu to ask his question. Can I just ask him to ask his one question now, and then we can move on to the next person after the, who's after the Express. Okay, thank Is you. James White still there? Thank you very much. Um, this this question is for um, Richie, Dr. Um, Professor Robertson. Um, in terms of the the, the strategies that, that you um, would have employed here in Montserrat and the lessons learned, how were you able to implement those on the ground in St. Vincent at this time? Um, well, I, I think... There's a lot that, that we have learned from and applied, um, both in the context of, of Montreal, but also in the context of other territories that we operate in. Um, certainly one is the big push that we currently have for outreach. Uh, one of the most significant, I think, um, things about this eruption, apart from you know how it's played out in terms of the guidance given, is the fantastic amount of educational outreach materials that have been produced um, to a wide community within the region, within St. Vincent, within the global community. And that, to a large extent, I think, comes out of a lesson from Montserrat. One of the things that we learned in Montserrat is that Seismic, as an agency, had to focus much more on getting scientific information out. And over those years, we have slowly built up the capacity to do that. And, and this eruption, in a sense, largely because of some fantastic people we have at Seismic, um, we have been able to do that. Uh, to, to produce that. So I think that's one thing. The other thing in terms of the management of it, which is another aspect, is, is the extent to which we have moved in a collaborative way. We, we very early on in this eruption, we, we began to speak to each other, both at Seismic and at MVO. So we had a, a, a lot of discussion going. But also we engaged a wider community, you know, um, colleagues who might have worked in Montreal, who we have done research with in the UK, the US. We engaged them and we have been discussing things with them. And also we reached out to, to people wider field, agencies like, like USGS, VDA, um, IPGP, agencies that we had worked with before, um, but I wish we had a relationship with. We engaged them in terms of getting things done. So that collaboration, that coordination of the collaboration, which is, which is largely guided by Dr. Joseph, the director, is one of the, the, the successes of this thing again. And it's, it's one of the things that we learned from Montreal. We needed to be more collaborative, more coordinated in terms of how we um, and understand scientific information 
and how we make sure that that feeds into the government. I think there are lots of other things you learn, to be honest, but I think those are two that I would just like to pinpoint. Thanks for that, Reggie. And I think that speaks very well to the fact that it really is a multidisciplinary effort in managing this eruption, in addition to scientists and communicators. And it also speaks to, to the UE through the Seismic Research Center being very relevant and impactful in communities. Um, and so I'm glad that you emphasize that point. Um, can we get the next question from the media, Amelia, please? We have written questions coming in, so you can maybe take it from your um, from your end, Stacey. Sure, okay. Um, so we have a question here. Oh, this is a good question coming in from Extreme 104.3 FM. I'm not sure where that station is located, but what are the indicators of the eruption coming to an end? That's an important question. How do we know when the eruption is ending or has ended? I think that's a good so one. Like that. That's a good <laughs> one for Rod. Yeah, sorry about yes. that. Yeah, that's a good question for Rod. Sorry. I, 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 I think it's a very good question. We have to, we, it, it, it's sort of, it's lopsided. We're quick to say that the eruption has started because we want to keep people safe. For the same reason, we have to be slow to say it's ended. We have to make sure that, that nothing is going to happen before um, things go back. So we have a number of monitoring techniques that we use. The seismic is one. And in the seismic, I would look for a total lack of the long period earthquakes and a lack of swarms of the VT earthquakes. Our ground deformation, we would look for a settling down of the volcano, it stopped either swelling or it stopped um, contracting. We're also doing things like we're measuring the gas, and, and the gas is good to indicate what's happening. We would want that to show us that nothing is going on. So I think we would need a combination of observations before we could say it was ending. And now we're certainly not in that place. So we, we hope it's slowing down. It does look as if it's slowing down. But we have to wait and, and see if it's got more explosions in it and what the data does. And then we might be able to say that the eruption is ending. Thank you Did for you? that, Rod. And yes, th thank you very much, Rod. And I think what you're talking about there is the importance of timing. And maybe before we go to the next um, question from the media, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that timing and that almost perfect timing that we were able to provide the government of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines so that evacuations were held not too too soon, but not too late, just 24 hours before the, ex the um, explosive phase began. Um, that's, that's a rare kind of success story. And I wondered if, um, Richie, maybe if you wanted to talk a little bit more about the events leading up to that perfect timing. Uh, uh, yes, and, I, and I'm sure Rod will jump in because he was critical in the operation in that regard, and if I miss anything. But I, I think what, what you do when you're looking at volcanoes and, and, and trying to figure out what's happening is that you, you, you essentially try to look at, 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 at patterns and see if when patterns change and if you can detect it or what the patterns might mean. And the patterns might be patterns of earthquakes, it might be patterns in terms of ground deformation, in terms of the gas. But I think in this case, the fundamental thing that we used in this case was really the seismics because a lot of the other signals, a lot of the other data points um, wasn't really making any clear indication one way or the other. And I think our first moment of discomfort was probably on the 23rd of March when we had a VT earthquake swarm that lasted for about uh, 45 minutes. So that was the first time, in a sense, in the eruption that we had had, you know, real earthquakes indicating something before that. What we had had was dome growth, and we had signals associated with growth of a dome. So they were, were a bit ambiguous. But we had a VT swarm um, that started at 10.30 a.m. that morning. And that was sufficiently concerning to us that we, we actually had a briefing of the cabinet um, intermission the day after to tell them, well, this had changed, and if we were a bit more concerned about what it was saying. And then things settled a little bit, and then... On the 5th of April, we had another VT swarm, but this one was a bit more intense. Um, and that again raised our, our, our alarm. And again, we, we briefed the government and, and we were a bit concerned. And we, by then, 
we were then looking at, at whether or not we're getting into something that was fundamentally changing. And the next sort of fundamental change in terms of these patterns that we were seeing was on the 8th of April, which was the, the day before, when we started to, to detect these, um, these tremors, um, which, which Ward mentioned in his summary. These, these indicators that something was um, sort of moving on, on, under the volcano, that things were moving, we, we began to get tremors. It moved from just simply tremoring, which is, you know, um, discrete um, shaking of the volcano, to then banded tremor, which means that we started to get periods when you had tremor and then a gap, a break, and then tremor and then a break. It began to go in bands. And by then, we had gotten sufficiently concerned that, again, we, we, we briefed cabinet and said that the, the next thing that we, we probably, you know, it's, it's clearly indicated that something is turning up because trauma suggests magma is on the move. There's no question of it. So the, our concept was that the, the, the VT earthquakes had, had indicated that something had broken through. And now, after it had broken through, it was clearly indicated with tremoring that it was moving. So that when it got into continuous tremor, which was the next thing, there was no question. Um, continuous tremors suggest that it is actually moving, that, that there's no question. And then the problem was that you can't, you don't really know exactly where the tremor is coming from. So you didn't know how far or how, how, how close it was to the summit. And I think the final nail was the fact that at that time, which was, which, which was um, uh, the day before, we were getting close to the end of the day. And, and our concern was that because we didn't know what could happen in the next 24 hours and because, you know, you didn't want it. You didn't know what it would happen in the night or in the day. It was a bad idea to really have people in those areas overnight and having something start then. So that that was sort of the continuous from was kind of the last nail. And we, we then alerted the government and, and they took a decision that it was time to move people. So so that was the final thing that, that it had moved from VT earthquakes, uh, swarms to tremor, to banded tremor, to tremor, to, to, to continuous tremor. And that, that was the, the last thing. And um, you know, to a large extent, the volcano, you know, we, we wouldn't like to say we are lucky, but the volcano gave us clear signs of what it was about to do. And we were fortunate that we had on the ground people, and, and I have to give Rod full kudos for that, um, who recognized these signs because of their experience. And in recognizing those signs, we were able to give guidance that made a difference. Um, that said, all of that sort of that, that activity, that intense activity just before was really just a culmination of all of the effort that went in before to put in a network to analyze what was happening. So, so really this was a combination of effort by lots of people that led to us giving that, that sort of advice. And, and true to form, the volcano did what we thought it was about to do. And, you know, it, it, it ended up being, thankfully, a success story in that people were able to get out, get out safely, and nobody got harmed. And that, that's what seismic and that's what volcanologists monitor volcanoes that is what we ask for that's what we want all the time so we we are quite glad that that happened quite fortunate that it happened and hope that you know as we go on that people would would heed the advice that's given because we have shown that the advice that we have given you know leads to things that we suggest might happen so it's a good idea to listen to what what they're saying and, and avoid you know going to the volcano and, and it's still dangerous and bear that in mind actually ends Thank you. Um, Thank you, Richie. And, and also speaks to the importance of, of supporting um, agencies like the Seismic Center in the monitoring um, events that may not happen very often, not as often as hurricanes, but of course, when they happen, the impact can be far more devastating. So it's very important to ensure that we have the resources needed to, to do the jobs we do so that we can save lives um, in this way. Are, are there any other questions waiting um, in, the, in the Zoom room, Leah? Yes, any other hands raised? Can see you may go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Alugan Express News in Montserrat, Malika McKenzie. My questions, um, my question is to any one of the scientists. With continued eruptions, is there a worry about the air quality for those of us in the safe zone? And I say those of us because even though some of the islands are not getting ash and all of that, but they are getting light dusting and all of that coming all the way down, even to Montserrat. So is there a worry about the quality of air? Rod, is that something you might be able to, to address? I know you have uh, yes, I, I can in Montserrat. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean... 
based really on a vast amount of experience from Montserrat and living with a volcano that produced a lot of ash, there is, I don't think, any worry about the, the quality of the, the air in the surrounding islands or even in the, the south of St. Vincent. Having said that, you know, people here, especially here in the volcano, do have to take measures. The, the ash gets remobilized by the wind, it gets everywhere, it gets in your food, it gets in the water, it gets in that. You, you have to take a lot of care in cleaning and trying to keep the ash out of your life. But in, in Montserrat, the ash is only really a, a, an irritant. It didn't have any health um, downside. And the same should apply here. We do have some experts that we are sort of collaborating with who know a lot about th this area. And I think, I'm pretty sure samples are being sent and we will be having discussions with them so we can test the ash here to see if there is anything else in it. But if it's like the Montserrat ash, there's nothing to worry about, I would say, except for the sort of the irritant, but it is a very big irritant living in the ash. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. And we did have a question from um, Guardian. Sorry, um, we did have a question from Guardian Media Limited related to that and asking about ashfall in Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm guessing that the answer would more or less um, be the same. Your response would be the same for that. Yeah. Yeah. There's very little um, that would get to Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, Alia, from the Zoom room? Yes, Radio Montserrat has their hands up again, so I'll hand over to them. Thank you very much. Um, either Professor Robertson or, or, or Rod can answer this one. Um, I'm looking through the, the lens of um, hazard and vulnerability and in terms of the fallouts from, from the volcano. Um, in, in terms of you know, demarcation of the zones like orange, um, red as the case may be. Uh, what are some of the, 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 the factors that you, you've been looking at to determine how far, for instance, say the red zone is expanded to? Um, Cece, I'm gonna probably try that one. Yes. Right. So. Um, the, the fundamentally hazard map on St. Vincent is based on um, a review of the historical activity of the volcano. And the current one, which I have behind me, which is, is what's called an integrated hazard map, which is uh, an, an effort to integrate all the different hazards and, and, and put it in a very simple way. It is based um, on an event similar to or close to the 1903 eruption. And what it does, it tries to look at what are the areas in the case of the red zone, what are the areas that are going to be affected in a maximum way by all the possible things the volcano could do, which is the heaviest ash falls, um, the heaviest blocks of, of rocks, ballistics that could come out, where the densest pyroclastic, where the pyroclastic flows and surges can go, um, lahars and things like that. And that, that is the red zone. Um, we, we don't anticipate that to vary unless the eruption indicates to us that it's it's its dimensions is significantly more than the 1902, and currently it hasn't done that. So I think the red zone would still be as it is defined now um, behind me, which is which is an area which could be affected in a serious way by all the nasty things the volcano can do. As you move into the orange and the yellow and the other zones, you get into sort of more peripheral areas. Um, certainly the orange zones are in the fringes of where the surges, which are the the um, you know, with the bigger paraclastic flows, the longer run of paraclastic flows, it's possible that the fringes of them could get into some parts of the orange zone. So the surges, um, it probably would be not so hot then by the time they get there. Those are the, the northern parts of the orange zone will include that. As you move south of the orange zone, you get into the yellow. Um, you're really getting into areas that at, at most would be affected by ashfall. They wouldn't be affected by paraclastic density currents. Um, they wouldn't be affected by large blocks of rocks. Um, they would be affected by anything besides asphalt. Um, they would be affected by lahars because if you put a lot of ash into the atmosphere into the, on the land, the lahars form when rain falls. So as you move south from the yellow to the green, you get in areas to areas which would be affected mainly by infrequent ash falls. Um, so most of the ash goes offshore to the east and south, east and west of St. Vincent, but sometimes it blows south and it can affect the southern part. 
So in summary, as you move from red to yellow, uh, to orange to yellow to green, you're moving to areas which are less affected and particularly to areas that are really only going to be affected by ash falls. As you move, as you, once you're in red, you're dealing with other things besides ash falls, pyroclastic density currents, and other things like that. But as you move south, it's mainly ash that's determining the boundary. Thanks, Richie. And so just to confirm, because we did have a question from Extreme 104.3 FM um, asking if you would ever get to the point of evacuating the yellow zone. So I'm, I'm guessing that based on what you said, that that would not be likely? Not likely. Um, and, and the only way you could have that scenario is if um, you are unable to deal with the impact of excessive ash falls. So if you were to have the kind of ash fall you had at the beginning of the eruption, and you had that over a sustained period of time, and then you were unable to deal with the removal and the effects of the ash and water supply. If you were, well, then it would become difficult for people to, to, um, to live there, and then you, you might have to move them further south. But it's not that they're going to be killed. They're going to be that they're going to have so much ash, it's going to be uncomfortable and difficult for them to live there. So it's unlikely because most of the ash, as I said, go offshore because of the way in which the wind blows. And it's only if you have really intense sort of plinian, subplinian activity, which constantly jetting ash into the atmosphere for over a sustained period, and it's likely for the plumes to get so big, um, spread so big that they could spread the whole island. So that's unlikely that that will change currently in this current, what this eruption is showing us currently. Thank you very much. Um, Aliyah, any other questions from this yeah. room? Yes, we have Mr. Henry. Please go ahead with your question, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone hearing me? Yep. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Henry. Just reminding okay. you, could let us know which media house you're from, please. Actually, I'm covering the volcanic um, situation for Reuters. I'm here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay, thank okay. You. yeah. Questions, um, one, just two questions. The new crater, um, according to the information we received, is now measuring 900 meters north to south and 750 meters east to west. Um, Dr. Robertson, is that indicative of the two domes being pulverized in addition to part of the mountain being blown up? And can I ask a second question or wait? One question at a time, please. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, all right. So, so in response, I, I believe, I'm not sure if the, the new dimensions come out. I believe the dimensions are more close to 800 rather than 9. But that doesn't really matter fundamentally to your question. Your question is whether or not the fact that you have a big crater has anything to do with the fact that You've had explosions that have destroyed the pre-existing domes that you had, both the 2020, 21 one, and parts of the 1979. Uh, yes, the, to a certain extent, the size of the crater has to do with the explosivity of the volcano, and, and, and the size of the crater had to do with you had a lot of gas trapped, and you had a magma that came out that was very dynamic and very gas rich, and it's in its original, its, its earlier parts of its, its evolution was such that it created these very intense explosions, and that is what reamed out the hole to a large extent. Of course, once that had reamed out an initial hole, additional explosions over time, because you had so many explosions, just continue to, to um, create a hole. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't destroyed any part of the pre-existing mountain itself. The crater, the pre-existing crater as a fundamental structure is still there. What has been damaged is inside the crater, the areas where you had the 2020 20, 21 dome and the 1979 dome, part of it has been destroyed. And it has essentially created a large hole through which magma has been pushed into the atmosphere explosively. Thank you very much, Richie. And your second question from Reuters. Yes. Yesterday, um, we, felt, yes. we felt about five earth tremors in the space of 90 to 120 minutes. Um, Dr. Robertson, is there any relation between those tremors and the continuing situation at La Sufia? Actually, Stacey, I, I've heard that before, and I let Rod answer that because Rod looks at the drums, and I think I know the answer, and I think Rod is best to answer that. Rod, over to you. Of course, yes. Okay. Yes, we, we had a number of um, 
inquiries about people feeling earth tremors. We looked at our equipment. There's no indication of any tremors on the volcano. The um, seismologists at SRC in Trinidad, they looked at all their equipment and there's no indication of any earthquakes in the region that could have been felt. Nothing remotely large enough to be felt. So whatever was felt by the people in Kingston was not an earthquake. It, it, I don't know what it was because I wasn't there. But sometimes you feel trucks rumbling or some atmospheric disturbance or, or something like that, and you think it's an earthquake. So it, it, it was basically false news. It, it wasn't an earthquake, but because people are a bit jumpy, they're, 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 they're attuned to the fact that there's a volcano here, that maybe made people think it was an earthquake that was going on. So there's no concern there. Uh, thank you, Rod, and thank you, Roy. Just for your question, Rod, while while we have you on the floor, I just wanted to to get a question, an answer for you. There's a question from Earl Bousquet. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. From Saint Lucia, asking about um, what are some of the positive um, uses of volcanic ash, and I'm wondering if, based on your experience at the MVU, Saint Montserrat has been working on that. If you could answer that question. Well, at, at the moment, a substantial part of Montserrat's economy is actually exporting ash, um, exporting gravel. The, the Caribbean suffers from a shortage of suitable sand for building. Beach sand is, is really not a good thing to use. And, and Montserrat basically has clean sand that's been sorted and is sold in the barge load. There's three or four barges every week that go to other islands. Now, this is actually sand that's been sorted in lahars and in rivers, but it, it is there for mining. So that's, that's one benefit of it. Otherwise, there's no huge benefits I can see. I mean, there's a, if you have a tourist industry, you might be able to sell bits of, of, of rock to people. It has uses in agriculture, I believe. It, I know at one stage, the University of the West Indies Woods Research Department we're looking to see if it is suitable for building roads with. But there are possibilities there. So, um, and, and I heard Richie say this to someone recently, entrepreneurs should be thinking of uses for this ash because there's, 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 there's a lot of it there. And, and if it can be used for anything, go ahead and use it. Definitely. And I, of course, we know yet. yet. Okay, wait until things are finished. I just realized I was encouraging people to find the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just re reminding that the red zone is still um, prohibited access. And of course, we know that the ash um, leads to fertile soil and bumper crops. And I, I know that people in St. Vincent and Bobby just are looking forward to that. And on the question of ash, we do have a question um, from Extreme 104.3 that I'm hoping Pat can answer. Um, and this is a question saying, asking again, um, how soon can we expect the analysis of the ash? I know you addressed that earlier on, but they're also asking about what would you suggest as best practices until then in terms of um, living with, with the ash and what should people be doing? Patsy, you want to take that so, one? Sure. So the analysis of the ash <clears throat> would show the amount that one of the primary uh, analyses is grain size distribution. And that would show how fine the ash is in terms of what is respirable. So think of, of, of the size of the ash grains as the size of, um, of, of a hair particle, you know, the thin, that thinness. And um, so we're looking for, for how uh, fine that ash is, to see how much gets into the deeper part, if any, gets into the deeper part of their lungs. Now, naturally, we get rid of it um, through our own, you know, um, normal everyday, the coughing and, and so on. So that, you know, that is really in the upper respiratory system, but it's the, the finer parts that get into the deeper, the deeper parts of your lungs that may, you know, um, may pose a, a greater risk, but more to people who have chronic uh chronic illnesses, respiratory illnesses. So um, other than that, I mean, we encourage uh, people who, who are susceptible, those who suffer from chronic respiratory illnesses to wear masks if they're outdoors. When you're indoors, you know, try to keep um, your windows sealed and so on. If there's a lot of traffic outside, 
um, ventilate when there's less traffic and there's less uh, disturbances of the ash. But other than that, I mean, uh, in terms of the time for analysis, that would, wouldn't really affect anything in terms of what you need to do now and what you continue, what you will have to continue to do. So, so in terms of the size, the, you know, the, the time for the analysis, um, that wouldn't, that still wouldn't really affect what you need to do in order to keep yourself um, or those who are susceptible to um, chronic respiratory illnesses, such as asthma and COPD, to, to take these measures to kind of limit the inhalation of the ash. But to, as um, Rod mentioned, you know, there's no long-term you know, uh, impacts unless this thing goes on for months to years. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's really not, um, not going to, to do anything to you in terms of your health for any severe impacts. Um, just those who, who, as I said before, suffer from chronic respiratory illnesses to kind of minimize their, their exposure by wearing masks when they're outdoors and trying to keep the, the indoors as as free as possible um, by, you know, keeping windows closed and so on when ash is being re remobilized. Thank you, Pat. And um, I know that people can get a lot of information on living with ash and, and having, um, taking safety precautions on the website of the International Volcanic Hazard Health Network, IVHHN. And I'm um, sure we'll get that website up on screen at some point during today's broadcast. So I know we have two hands raised in the Zoom room. So Aaliyah, can you let us know who is next, please? Hi, yes, Mr. Rusha. Can you please go ahead? Mr. Rusha, are you there? I guess not. Um, Let's go to the second person. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Yes, Miss. Um, I'm seeing a surname, Berilia. Yes. Yes. Can you hear? You can just state your name and, and the organization. That you, yes, we can hear you. Can you just say your name again and the organization that you're with, please? Hi, my name is Emmanuel Berilia, and I'm um, the host of Politically Incorrect. Um, I, I have one or two questions. I know you the order of things, so I just jump right into it. Um, the question pertains to the activity that was going on in Soufrir, um, perhaps for the last few years with the geothermal. The question basically is, is it a possibility that the activity may have triggered the volcano? And, and if so, what can we expect going forward from the, I suppose, the, the compromising of the integrity of the volcano that was pretty much dormant prior to that? Is that a question that Pat, you think you can do? I could start, and I know Rod has experience in geothermal energy as well. So, no, the, 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 any geothermal exploration being done um, on the volcano prior to the eruption would have just um, involved a very, very surface exploration. There's a very shallow, um, hydro, what we call a hydrothermal system. This is when water, meteoric water rainfall, interacts with the rocks that have been heated up um, by the deeper system. And that in itself boils and is, is you know, rises back to the surface as steam. And that's what we saw, um, these areas of, of uh, venting in the dome itself. And then there's a, you know, there was a Wallyboo hot springs. So, so this type of geothermal exploration does not tap into the magma. It doesn't get any, you know, that very deep. We're talking about a couple uh, hundred meters um, below the, the surface, uh, and it, it does not disturb the magmatic system at depth. So in terms of it causing any kind of unrest or stimulating unrest of the volcano, no, it's, it's not linked. Yeah, and Rod has something to add to that? Uh, well, I mean, Pat, Pat stated it perfectly. It, no, there, there would, wouldn't be a link. Just to add that we've been, although we've put in lots of monitoring equipment in advance of this eruption, 
the volcano has been monitored fairly continuously since the last eruption in 1979. And there's been no sign of, of anything. Um, and if there had been something from the geothermal, we would have seen it associated with times yeah. when geothermal work was being done. So, yeah, yeah, there's no link between the geothermal and this eruption. Okay, thank you very much, Ron and Pat. Um, and Leah, do we have any other questions? Yes, so we have room? Mr. Rusha. I'll try him again. I don't know if he'll come on. His hand is there is. Thank you so much. Yes, yes Mr. Rusha. So, uh, yeah, Jamie Jagoshi from ABS Radio and Television in Antigua. I was wondering, I think it was Professor Robinson who said that the pyroclastic flows had gone out to about two to three miles from the volcano and that some had gone into the sea. About how many homes or buildings have been, say, destroyed by the pyroclastic flows, if any, so far? Um, uh, none. Essentially, the flows have gone towards areas of the country which does not have um, villages. They have gone, if you, in the context of the map behind me, they have gone towards the west in the area that goes from the sort of close to the southern boundary of the red zone, just north of that, all the way um, to the northwest. They haven't gone to Fancy or Oya or Sandy Bay and areas in the east. So the destruction that it has wrought, if anything, would be for people who have um, farms and farm houses at that side of the mountain, but certainly not any major structures like houses and homes and, and in villages that are all on the east, not on the west of the country. Richie, thanks for that. And while we have you on the floor, we do have a question coming in asking, what is the yeah. difference between a pyroclastic flow and, and magma? Can you just address that one, please? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, so magma is the general term that we give to the material before it has hit the surface. So. The material that's coming from beneath the surface, um, you could think of it like um, liquid rock. It's, it's a mass of crystals and, and gas and, and material that moves up. Once it gets to the surface, it's just a terminology that we then use. Um, geologists call it lava. So once it gets to the surface, it's lava. And depending on how it comes out, you might have a lava flow like you have in Hawaii, or else it comes out explosively. You have things like blocks and bombs. You have ash. You have pyroclastic flows. Those kinds of ways are ways in which the, mag the lava, which is the magma that came from below, is brought onto the land and deposited in different forms. So, so that's what happens to it um, in this context. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of hands raised again in, in the Zoom room. Alia, can you let us know who's I asking? believe Mr. Rusha still has another question or he had put his hands down. Um, Leah Sarayas. Express News, I believe. You can go ahead. Thank you. Um, Leah Soros from Express Newspapers. I know it was mentioned um, that Lahas were detected uh, following um, the first eruption, I think, uh, with the rainy season approaching. Is there a fear of further destruction um, on the island um, by Lahas? And can you say if this can reach to the south or safe south of the island or, or the safe zone areas. Thank you. Richie, can you take that one? Um, yeah, um, quickly. Yeah, yes. Um, in fact, I spoke, I've, we've spoken extensively to the government about the potential for lahar damage. One of the things that happens in volcanoes um, like ours who have explosions and create a lot of fragments of rock and fragments of material that is deposited on the land high up is that whenever you have, and, and if it's in a tropical area which you have where you have rainfall, whenever you have rainfall, that material is remobilized and it creates mud flows or lahars. So yes, the potential of lahars and the damage and destruction from lahars would continue in Simonson for quite a long time. When I say a long time, certainly I would estimate not just rainy season, but the next rainy season, you still have going to be having stuff up there that is going to be mobilized and potentially cause damage. In terms of what it affects the southern areas, no, it's not going to. It's going to affect largely areas on the volcano. Um, and I would guess at most, if it affects any areas in the south, it really would depend on areas in the south, which has a lot of ash dumped in it. And, and so far, 
The area where you have most ash uh, on the volcano itself, Sufre, La Sufre, as well as you have significant amounts in Richmond, in, in, in Mount Brisbane. So I expect that places like Chateau Belair, um, Petit Baudel, um on the on the West Coast and also Georgetown may have some damage from Lahas because of the amount of ash that have been put on the on the mountains that 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 they, they are basically settling next to. So but further south, in terms of King Sound and, and areas in the green and yellow zone, because you haven't had so much ash, I would expect that Lahas are, are, less, less, are going to be less of a problem. So the main problem is on the Sufre, where you have most of the material dumped. And as you move into the orange areas, you're probably going to orange zones, you're probably going to have some impact um, because of the amount of material that has been um, deposited on the land. Uh, and there is a quick um, follow-up question, Richie, asking if given the threat yep. of Lahas, if there's a quick follow-up question asking if given the threat of Lahars, if the red zone should be permanently evacuated. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that's, a, that's an administrative decision because it's not, it's not a matter of the threat of Lahars. It's the threat of volcanic hazards. And in any place that you have, any, there are a number of places in the region where you have volcanoes and where you have um, development and we have people. There are a number of territories in the world, uh, you know, in Italy, in, in, in various other countries, where populations live close to volcanoes. And, and really, the decision to live close to a, a hazardous volcano, a volcano that clear up, is really, you know, a decision that people have to make. Um, I would say that if you... If you if you live in these areas, um, it's not Lahas alone going to be a problem. Sufra is going to erupt again at some point in the future, and, and Lahas is going to be just something that continues after, but it's going to be when the volcano is erupting, it's going to be a problem. So you will always have a problem once you live on an, a live, active a volcano that could erupt, like Sufra. Um, so the question is, um, is making sure that you have planning in place that you minimize the, the potential impact of these assets. Um, you know, so... It's a decision for the for the territories, authority, for the authorities, for the government, for the people who live there. Um, but whatever they decide, if you live on a volcano that can erupt into the Vincent Grandes or anywhere in the region, you must cater for the fact that you have to deal with when the volcano wakes up and erupts and what you do. Um, both what you do when it's erupting, which is to move off, evacuate, but also what you do after when you have to deal with secondary hazards like Lahas and things like that. And so that, that but, speaks um, to the impact. Yes, Pat, so please go ahead. Sorry, Stacey, I just want to add quickly sure. that, so while the physical hazards is, is one aspect of things, is the redevelopment of the area is also the other side of the coin because the impacts of, of this eruption it will be significant and it will take a substantial amount of support from regional and international agencies to help rebuild and to deal with the, I don't want to say cleanup, but, you know, any infrastructural um, damage and so on that's done to restore services to the red zone. So it's a combination of, of both um, the amount of resources that's needed to kind of rebuild and how long that will take, as well as the, the compounding and um, hazards that may linger, um, such as the Lahars, even after the eruption has ended. Yes, and that's... Um, Pat, that's a very important point, looking at the, at the impact and the, the significant impact that the eruption would have had, um, long-term impact as well. And I know that uh, it's a good, probably a good time to mention that the UE has activated its own response, its own uh, response to the um, eruption. And there's a website set up called Rally Round SEG. And going to that website, people can find out ways in which they can support um, people in St. Vincent at this time as part of the first phase, which includes a rapid response. Just asking for people to mute their mics, please. Just asking if everyone can mute their mics, please. As part of the first phase, um, which includes a rapid response and the deployment of brief and, and relief aid, I'm sorry, special priority will be given towards healthcare, education, and displaced students left vulnerable. So we can find out more in terms of ways in which you can give at um, Rally Round SVG, which is a special dedicated website set up by the UNI to support those affected by the eruption in St. Vincent. And of course, I know the Seismic Research Center itself would be in need of support um, following this eruption. I don't know, Pat, if you would have wanted to talk about that a little bit before we move on to the next question in terms of the impact on our monitoring network that this eruption would have had and the kind of support that the agency would need in order to continue continue monitoring operations um, in the region. 
Do you want to talk yes, about thank that you, move on to the next question? Sure. Yes, thank you. So um, what I failed to mention earlier um, when I gave my little brief about the work of the SRC is the way that w in which we're funded is we're funded by the con contributions from the different territories to which we provide a service to. And of course, over the last few years, we've had, um, you know, the, the Caribbean, um, we've been having a lot of, uh, we are multi-hazard environment and different islands have been impacted by other disasters like uh, hurricanes and storms and this uh, this this kind of leads into the financial challenges which then trickles down to us so um with the lack of of payments and late payments affecting the budget and this really definitely um limits our ability to to provide the the, the monitoring service that is needed in order to to um to serve the region as efficiently um as as you know is needed, especially um as demonstrated by the management of this eruption and providing the timely advice to government that's needed to see you know for, for the health and safety of people's lives. So I do um you know we actively seek our own funding through research projects and collaborations, as well as consultancies. And this actually is the way in which we're able to currently support our education and outreach program, which is entirely self-funded. And, and which, you know, as, as noted by Prof. Robertson, is one of the key tools that was needed, you know, during the entire management of this eruption. So, um, so we, we are definitely willing to partner with agencies that uh, you know, are looking to kind of improve the development of the region and provide, you know, any funding opportunities to improve not just the monitoring of uh, monitoring networks in the region, as well as to um, to augment any, you know, the other services that we provide, such as our education and outreach component. Thank you, Pat. Um, while I have you on the floor, we do have a question coming in asking if the other islands with volcanoes in the region if they also have hazard maps, such as the one that we would be mm -hmm. seeing for St. Vincent, and are those available online to the public? Yes. So every island in the English-speaking um, volcanic island in the English-speaking Les Antilles, as well as the French islands, um, have hazard maps. And this um, is compiled in a book um, published by the SRC called the Volcanic Hazard Atlas of the Lesser Antilles. Now, this book, um, we have donated many, many copies. It's available on DVD as well as hard copies. And they've been provided to all of the disaster coordinator offices, libraries, um, number of uh, agencies in each island. So, so yes, these maps are available. And yes, um, through our website as well, we have... Um, Island profiles. Now, I, our website is is currently being revamped, and there will be a new website soon. A lot of the information is also available on our website, where you will see island profiles created for each island, and under that, um, you would also see a summary of those maps. Thank you, Pat. And we do have one more question coming in from um, Radio ZJB in Montserrat, from Kafu. Yes. Um, good would you like to go ahead and ask a question? Good afternoon, and thanks for recognizing me once again. For the afternoon, we've been basically speaking science. But I want to put in a question here that maybe has to do with the people who live on St. Vincent. My question is, that uh, conference that was held in St. Vincent in 2014, the Striever conference and Striever for those who don't know is strengthening resilience in volcanic areas I just wanted to find out if anything coming out of that Striever conference would have helped to cushion the effects for the, the people of St. Vincent and maybe it's a question for Nemo but I don't know if Richie or Pat or Stacy, if you can add anything to that because that was a very intense conference and it was preparing the people of St. Vincent especially for something like this. So just wanting to know if anything out of that conference would have helped the people of St. Vincent, including the scientists. 
Uh, Richie, would you like to take that Richie. one? Mm -hmm. Very closely involved with the Striva project, as well as the Volcano Ready project. We can probably talk a little bit about that as well. Is Richie on? I'm not hearing. Yeah, you. sorry. Yes, I, I am. I am. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I followed your guidance to mute myself and then unmute myself just now. All right. oh, um, yes, Kafu, as, as, as usual, you asked some interesting questions, Kafu. We know, we know each other for a long time. But um, yes, the, the Striva, and not just Striva, but other projects that we have had over the last 10, 15 years, um, I think had resulted in some instances being, one of the, I, I, in my opinion, one of the most prepared in terms of dealing with this kind of activity that you had. Um, you know, We've been coming here, I think, close to 15 years. We, when I say we, I mean Seismic and the education outreach team, spending a week and doing lots of outreach, um, um, outreach activity. Then we had tough projects like Striva that produced a lot of materials. Coming out of that, we had a, a, an exhibition, we had films, we had various other things. All of that was fed into um, heightening the awareness, into helping to get St. Vincent to a stage where it was much more prepared for the hazard that they had to deal with. And more recently, as, as um, Stacey said, we had this Volcano Ready Communities Project, which was funded by the Caribbean Development Bank, where we focused on 14 communities, 14 of the very communities that are now evacuated, focused on them intensively in terms of preparing them for the, for the volcanic hazard in the context of volcanoes being a hazardous environment where you have other kinds of hazards associated. Of course, then we weren't thinking that it will actually be directly relevant to know because the, the, uh, the Volcano Ready Project finish about it. In fact, it hasn't really finished yet because some of the funding from it went into our preparation now. So in summary, I think Striva, as well as others, Striva particularly, but others, other projects that spilled off of that um, did feed into the overall um, effort that was put in by all the folks here, both Seismic and the authorities, Nemo and others, in terms of preparing intentions for the possibility of, of what they have to deal with now. Um, that said, you know, you could never really be truly prepared for something like this until you actually experience it. So, um, you know, I think although St. Vincent was as prepared as anybody else, I think there are systems that, that didn't function as well as they would have liked to. So there are all these things that you can learn. I'm sure when they move forward, that, that their systems and their plans will be even more robust than it was on this occasion. All right, thanks, Richie. Um, we just have a few more questions coming in here on yes. text that we'll address before we before we wrap up. Okay. While I have you, Richie, um, one of the questions is, yes, I'm sorry, is that uh, yes, I, 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 I just have one more, and this is particularly for Rod. Now we have had this conversation <laughs> for well over a year now, and he, he's probably smiling because. I, I've been questioning him on all of the earthquakes we have been experiencing throughout the region for well over a year now. And he was just telling me, well, you know, we are in a volcanic area, we are in a earthquake zone, so we must get earthquakes. But I want to throw that curveball at him again to ask him if all those earthquakes we were getting, if, it, if that was a precursor to the St. Vincent um, eruption. I think I know what he's going to say, but let him answer, please. Rod? <laughs> well, Kaku, you, you've answered yourself already. <laughs> not we live in an earthquake region, we have earthquakes. There's no link between those earthquakes and this eruption. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I hope I'm satisfied with that response. Um, Rod, Rod, while I have you, I just have a question here. Maybe you can answer. What is the possibility of a tsunami being generated from a pyroclastic flow um, off of the Sufre? And that question is coming from Guardian Media Limited in Trinidad and Tobago. Can you take that one, Rod? Yes, I will take that one. That, it, it is a good question. A volcano can generate tsunamis if a large pyroclastic flow goes into the sea. But this requires pyroclastic flow to have lots of material in it. So it's basically the mass of that material that generates the tsunami. And none of the pyroclastic flows we've seen so far have had anything near the um, amount of material that would be required to generate the tsunami. 
So it's very unlikely, but it is something that, that we're aware of. And it, if in the extreme case it does happen, we already have the links to the, the tsunami warning people to make sure that a warning goes out in a timely fashion. But it is incredibly unlikely, so it, it, it's not going to happen. One thing to Thank add, you, uh, Stacey. Yes, Pat. <laughs> yeah, so, so just to add to, to that, um, this week we actually had a meeting with um, uh, the PTWC and um, other members of the um, Caribbean early warning um, system. And there, are, there is an option right now to, um, to install a new tide gauge in the north of St. Vincent to be able to assist in providing a more real-time monitoring of, um, of sea disturbances in relation to the PDCs or anything else related to the volcano that may enter the sea that may cause enough of a disturbance to generate any tsunami waves. So that is something that was discussed and is being currently explored. Thanks, Pat. And just to add to that, the PTWC is a Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, which is essentially that alludes um, our region as to any um, approaching tsunamis or, or, or whatnot. Uh, Richie, last question, I think, for you from Carib Zone Media in New York. If you can answer, what is the level of displacement of the population on the island at this time? And that may be more of a Nemo question, but I'm not sure if it's something that you may be able to kind of weigh in to a bit. Um, I, I would have to guess. I think it's something like 15 to 20,000 people that have been displaced. Um, I may have that totally wrong, though. So that's the kind no, of numbers. No, you're correct. Okay, good. You're correct, Richie. It's, it's like 16,000 people with right. uh, a little over 5,000 in shelters on island. But... Um, so it is a fair amount. Yes, of course. And, and Pat, I know you have um, daily updates with, with Sedima, um, and you'd be giving that, getting that kind of information from them. Um, Pat, while I have you, this is the last question for you. Someone is asking, how large were those spines that emerged before the explosive part of the eruption? So unfortunately, we don't have a photo of that one to show. But when we had the, um, the December dome growing, there were spines detected. Do you have any idea yeah. how large those um, may have been? What were they? About 10, 10 meters? I can't remember. Yeah, oh. 10, 10 or 20 oh, meters yes. probably. Not meters. very large. Yeah, 10 to 20 meters. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. not very large. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think we have one last question. Do we have, Aaliyah, any questions about a particular tremor? Is that, did I get that correct? Mm -hmm. Or... <laughs> oh my yes, there was <laughs> one question about, coming across about uh, tremor. That's 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 again, it was about yeah. tremor. I'll leave Rod to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, so tremor please, please. Yeah. we know you all have a, a pet pig, tremor, who's been <laughs> getting a lot of engagement <laughs> on social media. He's, he's getting more likes than the scientific. Uh, I think tremor might be a she. <laughs> Um, so you all don't look very enthused about Tremor, but Tremor has a lot of fans. What was the question earlier as we wrap up? Just an update about him or her. How is he doing and what are you doing for him at the observatory? Who? It's okay. Tremor is a she, apparently. It's, yes. It's a <laughs> yeah, the feeling is a she, and she may well be pregnant. Um, oh, and damn. Observatory, observatory is not a good place to bring up young piglets. <laughs> we, um, we, had a visit, we had a visit yesterday from a, a vet representing, is it ECGC? I'm, I'm not sure what's the yeah, name of the organization. Yeah, ECGC, that's good. ECGC. And they're sort of responding to the public interest and they're, they're trying to trace the owner of Tremor. But if they can't trace the owner, we're trying to make an arrangement that Tremor can be housed fairly near to here near here so they'll make arrangements there for, for her to be housed and fed and get the care that she needs so um mm -hmm. she's she's doing fine and i, I mean she's healthy because she was rubbishing through the rubbish this morning so that's you know <laughs> yes. 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 
she gave you a job this morning, right? At 12, four yeah, this morning. Yeah, first part of the yeah. day cleaning up. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that update. Maybe the most important update for today's session. Um, I would like to thank our <laughs> presenters and the media for their, for their questions and some of the questions. Just hand over to Dr. Joseph to offer some closing words as we wrap up this afternoon session. Okay. So just to thank uh, all of our partners and collaborating agencies who, who have assisted us in the management of this eruption, uh, which is continuing. And um, clearly, after the experiences that we've had with this eruption, we know that there is a better need, um, a better a need for better assessment of the ash hazard impacts going forward um, with St. Vincent, but as well as other islands who may um, potentially be impacted by the ash, but other islands, other volcanic islands of the Lesser Antilles, who, um, it, as part of their planning in response to increased uh, activity. Um, on their island. There is also, um, of course, a need for investment in SRC's um, uh, operations, including not just the, the geophysical monitoring part of things, but also our outreach and education um, program. And, um, and we would just welcome any support from donor agencies who are willing to work with us to continue the work that we're doing to provide a service to the governments and the people of the region. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. And again, reminding our participants that although there have been pauses in activity at the volcano, the volcano is still dangerous as the eruption is ongoing. At this time, I wish to thank our presenters for taking the time to engage with the media today. I think we had a very lively discussion. We have facilitated countless media requests in the past week, and we're very pleased to be able to provide this additional opportunity for engagement. Many thanks to the media representatives who have joined and thank you for your questions. And there's additional information for the media on the Lassufra eruption pages of our website. A link should be coming up to that on the screen. And that includes a link to folder, um, a folder of photos that you may use crediting the UESRC. We also thank those viewing on social media for their participation. And again, we remind of the um, IVHHN's website on living with volcanic ash. We invite viewers and participants to support the UE's humanitarian response to the last of eruption by visiting the Rally Round SVG website, hashtag Rally Round SVG, to learn more about ways in which you can donate. Live daily updates on the ongoing activity at last of are broadcast Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on the UE TV channels throughout the region, as well as on the SRC's YouTube channel and scientific bulletins are posted to our website, um, www.uniseismic.com, and social media platforms daily. You may find us online at, at the website address on our screen, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation and attendance, and be safe. Thank you. Okay, great, everybody. Thank you so much. You are free to go. Thank you. Thank great. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.